Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm uh, pleased to uh, have uh, Lisa here today to uh, guide us through the National Stroke Guidelines and uh, what's involved in uh, keeping the stroke program going, ensuring a, um, a high level of care here. Uh, Lisa's put a lot of work uh, into the uh, uh, program. Um, and as, as a result of that, we've been able to achieve certification both with the state and the Joint Commission as a stroke center. One of the things we found as we've gone along is that uh, some of us get uh, a little uh, lackadaisical about both some of the simple things like filling out the stroke orders, but also there have been some management uh, issues in some cases that we really felt we could improve upon. And as a result of that, we had brought uh, this to the Medical Executive Committee, who agreed that we really needed to do something to strengthen the program, and that one thing that might be helpful was to be certain that everybody that was going to be seeing stroke patients and TIA patients had uh, been updated on um, what's really the latest in care of stroke patients, as well as uh, what's necessary really just to maintain our certification uh, as a stroke center. Um, I think uh, everyone here knows Lisa Schultz, our uh, head of the, uh, the Division of Neurology. Uh, Lisa uh, completed her training at Brown, and um, she's uh, been one of our uh, stellar teachers, uh, a winner of uh, the teaching award uh, uh, with the uh, UMDNJ uh, house staff. And um, I've heard part of this lecture, and I'm uh, Happy to be hearing again, actually, because this is a really good review. So, Lisa, we'll let you get started. Great. Thanks. Okay. So, um, as Alan had mentioned, this is going to attempt to be a brief overview of the current knowledge about cerebrovascular disease so that we're all operating in perfect kind of 2009. And it's not just government compliance, but it's all about patient care. So, um, during this talk, we're going to, of course, be hitting TPA as well as some of the most recent trials that you may have been hearing about, um, as well as the management of the patients when they're in the hospital, since the vast majority of patients don't get tpa as well as this will be more important for your offices, but also how we should be discharging these patients and setting them up in terms of uh, medical and possible surgical uh, secondary prevention. So briefly, just so everyone remembers, um, stroke is the third leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, 700,000 death uh, strokes annually, and it is the leading cause of functional impairments in the United States. So it has surpassed motor vehicle accidents and trauma uh, within the past year. 20% of all stroke survivors are going to require long-term institutional care. And that's after three months. So that's after your three months of rehab when we're hoping we're going to get you back into the community. Um, they have yet to calculate uh, the, um, the cost of stroke for 2007, but in 2006, the cost for the U.S. is $57.9 billion. So that's direct medical care as well as uh, wages lost as well as long-term care for these patients. So briefly, let's talk about TPA. And you can see in your packets, um, you know, we do have uh, stroke protocols for every type of cerebrovascular event, both for strokes um, that are acute, that are being considered for TPA, as well as for the ischemic strokes or TIAs, as well as for the hemorrhagic strokes. So briefly, Everybody remembers, I think they came out with this like 10 years ago, that time is brain. And that's because every 60 seconds of complete ischemia leads to irreversible damage of 1.9 billion neurons. So even quote unquote TIAs do lead to some brain damage. IVTPA, which actually became FDA approved in 1996, secondary to the ECAS trials, uh, decreases um, your deficit. So it improves your chance of minimal or no disability at six months. It can increase it by up to 50%. TPA rarely causes what we call the Lazarus effect, where we inject the drug and within a matter of minutes to hours, you immediately seem to be better. 
It's more in the setting of three to six months out, we see, that you're much improved. So if you are given IV TPA, and they did um, uh, look at these trials, and they made sure that the patients with very large vessel strokes who got TPA were compared to large vessel strokes who didn't get TPA, you were three times more likely to be alive at six months. And since everyone is very focused right now on cost, um, an issue is, is that the number needed to treat for clinically meaningful improvement is three TPA patients. So that's a pretty good drug overall. If you want to quickly look at uh, the beginning of your packet, it talks about TPA patients. And whether you're in the emergency room, whether you're being run in by EMS or by family members, or whether you're an inpatient at Lourdes, this is the protocol that we use, and this is the protocol that every stroke center uses. Of course, we do all the simple ABCs. Check your vitals. We check your glucose because, as we all know, hypoglycemia can cause focal neurologic deficits. It's typically a glucose of less than 50 as well as hyperglycemia, glucose of 350 to 400. Um, we want to know what your heart rhythm is, as well as an EKG, as acute MIs often run in conjunction with acute strokes. Um, all of our nurses, as well as our emergency room physicians, are educated in the what we call the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale. And what that is, is that's just a quick, simple, easy scale of 0 to 30. 0 meaning you're perfect, no neurologic deficits. 30 meaning you're close to death. And it's a way of communicating so that the neurologist who's maybe 50 miles away from the hospital can understand what a nurse or another doctor is seeing. And when patient care is handed off, we can also tell if people are stable. Um, and then, of course, we check your basic labs for acute strokes because we want to know, are your platelets okay? Um, what's your INR? Are you having an acute MI? When we're thinking about TPA, which, of course, as you know, is basically a drug that makes you unable to clot your blood for 24 hours, we always, all of our acute stroke patients get two IVs placed, and they're in one in each arm. And so that's if we lose one IV, and maybe there's a large hemorrhage, and that's what caused us to lose an IV, we have another good line. We always get a CAT scan of the head without contrast. You don't need contrast to see a stroke. You don't need contrast to see blood. And then, of course, you know, here it's always the next call often while all of this is going on, is to a neurologist to discuss the case. Now, if we're progressing forward, of course, what's happening is that at bedside, whether in the emergency room or on one of our medical floors, the acute stroke team, which can be the rapid response team made up of nurses, it may be made up of house staff from UMDNJ, it may be the neurologist or an emergency room physician or a critical care physician is also asking these questions either of the patient, the family, or they're reviewing the chart because there are very strict contraindications to TPA. That's what the trial showed us is that the risk of hemorrhaging from IV TPA if you follow all the rules is actually very low. It's a 7% chance of hemorrhaging somewhere in your body a 3% chance of hemorrhaging in the head if you follow all the rules. And it's only when you stray outside of the rules for TPA that the rates go up dramatically, often approaching 50%. We know that, so if you've had a, a acute MI at that moment, or you recently had an MI and you might have a little bit of pericarditis, clearly if you've had a hemorrhage, if you've had any type of interventional procedure or an arterial puncture in a place that we can't compress. So we give TPA all the time to people who had a stroke while they were in the cardiac cath lab if the intervention was through the femoral artery because we can compress that site. However, if there was something that was interventionally done up in the carotid arteries or if there was a 
brachial artery line or a site that we're not comfortable that we can compress, that's clearly a contraindication. And often we do have to drag in family members. Sometimes we have to call primary doctors in the middle of the night asking them if they know anything about their patients. Of course, also, uh, if they're young women, they can't be pregnant and they can't be lactating uh, when we do consider TPA. Similarly, if they've had a recent stroke, because the recent strokes, that damaged, dying brain is a source of possible hemorrhage. And of course, if they've ever in the past had any significant um, head trauma that led to a hemorrhage, also, then, there's some simple things that we don't realize, but we all like everyone's blood pressure to be up when they're having a stroke. We think that's going to help with circulation, but we don't want it to be uncontrolled when we're thinking about TPA. And so, as you can see, the last line, it talks about hypertension um, that is greater than 185 over 110 despite the attempts to lower that blood pressure. And so who gives TPA? You're not going to be hanging out on a limb, and you're not going to be hanging out a poor resident to dry. It's at Lady of Lords, there are three groups of physicians that are credentialed to give TPA. And it's neurologists, emergency room physicians, or critical care physicians. Um, the neurologists and emergency room physicians, they all would have to do a certain amount of stroke-specific CME. This just goes through some of the um, some of the numbers, and it's just a simple of you know we have to do it calculated based on weight. It's an infusion that goes through over 60 minutes, um, and during that infusion, it is very labor intensive. There's always one nurse assigned to that patient usually a critical care or emergency room nurse um, doing blood pressure monitoring and NIH scale. So here's a little bit about this is the way we manage patients after TPA. And I think this is important for all of you who kind of hear in the middle of the night, oh, by the way, we gave you a patient who has TPA. Because the first 24 hours is slightly different management than you would do for your normal stroke. So the first 24 hours, you must stay in the critical care unit. And because, A, you're a very labor-intensive patient, they're doing vitals and NIH checks constantly. But in addition, they are really watching you to see if you suddenly have a decline that may indicate we need to run you to a CAT scan to see if something bad has happened. What's also important to remember is that after TPA, we want to keep your blood pressure at a certain level, which is less than 180 over 90, because... Anything above that, when your blood can't clot, could lead to a hemorrhage. And at this time, and we'll talk about it later, the drug of choice, if you can't manage this patient with PRN medications, the drug of choice is a cardine drug. And the Lord Stroke Protocols actually go through exactly that. They tell you how many times to use a PRN drug, what drug to use, and then when to use the cardine drip and the parameters. And literally, it's a matter of just often telling house staff, check off the blood pressure parameters. Check off, you know, the blood pressure drips that we need. What else do you need to do? You need to have someone strictly, nothing by mouth, and strict bed rest for 24 hours. And that's, of course, very different than what we do for all the other patients. For the first 24 hours, no aspirin, no anticoagulation, and no sub-Q heparinoid products for 24 hours. We prefer that there are no arterial lines in that patient. All of the other accessory lines, we usually try to put in before we administer the TPA. So if there's going to be a need for a Foley or an NG tube or a central line, all of that is preferably placed before the TPA is administered. We always check a CBC at 24 hours for obvious reasons, because if there's a sudden drop in hemoglobin, we need to go looking for the source. 
And similarly, there's a CAT scan of the brain done at 24 hours, if there, or certainly if there's a sudden change in the exam. And all of this is once again on the protocols. So here's something now interesting. Well, why are we all so focused on TPA if only 10% of the patients receive TPA in America? And really, it's because of the timeline. People just can't get here fast enough because they often don't recognize that a stroke is a problem. But currently, there's a lot of different research trials going on, and there's been a lot of recent talk, probably it all started in March, with the publication of the ECAS-3 trial. So this is where they decided they were going to be bold and see if they gave TPA a little beyond that three-hour time window whether they saw any improvement, if the improvement outweighed the risk of the hemorrhage. And they actually did see a little bit of improvement. But what's important about this is that, as you can see, if you can actually give that TPA in the first 90 minutes, your odds for improving is 2.8. If you give it in that second half of that 180-minute time window that we all that the majority of our patients fall into, you get a 1.5 improvement, which is still an improvement. And then they did show that if you extended it out just a little further up to the 270, there was still a slight improvement, and that's taking into account all the subsequent hemorrhages that did happen when you gave TPA outside the time window. That is still not FDA approved. But it is something that people are looking at. But a big concern has been that this is going to let everyone sit back and say, well, we have, we have a long time to get that TPA in. And that's something that you have to always remember when your residents are calling you, when your patients are calling you, this is actually the goal time window that you want to give that drug. There are several other um, adjuvant kind of therapies and trials that are going on. Um, including performing Dopplers transcranially during TPA, thinking we're going to in some way destabilize um, the thrombus, minocycline medication during the first several hours, hypothermia, hypermagnesemia, all of the things that affect that cytokine cascade. But all of that's still in the works. So here's something else that is important that you recognize. Because once again, this is still an acute stroke. So this is someone who came in with a dense left hemiplegia. And this is his right MCA artery. And it's without contrast. This is the acute thrombus that's sitting in the MCA artery. And this is his brain after the TPA. So it didn't work. We didn't break apart the clot. When you hear a dense MCA sign, and a lot of times our radiologists will actually potentially be calling you saying, it looks like there's a thrombus. Or they may just say it's a dense MCA sign. This requires a little bit more than IV TPA. What we do here at Lourdes is we give IV TPA, and then we call the comprehensive stroke centers that we have transfer agreements with. Right now, one of them is Jefferson. And we tell them we have a dense MCA sign, which means we need to do something interventionally. And so the current therapy, the current standard of care for a dense MCA sign is after you administer the IV TPA, is intraarterial TPA. So they actually thread the wire and all the way up from the femoral artery, they get right near that thrombus. As you can see, there are no branches of the MCA artery here. And they administer intraarterial TPA. And you can see there's reconstituted branches. And really, that's about one of the best chances a patient has if you have intraarterial TPA. Interestingly enough, the time window for intraarterial TPA is longer. It's six hours. So if you happen to get a call from a resident in the middle of the night saying there's a dense MCA sign and, oh, by the way, their symptoms have been going on for five hours, 
you may still be within the time window to help your patients. There are also things that we can do that don't require TPA. And this we actually most recently did for a patient just about a few weeks ago who had a very large stroke about two days after his cabbage. And at that point, what we, um, we send them to Jefferson once again, and Jefferson actually does a mechanical thrombectomy. This happens to be the Mercy device, where you corkscrew through the clot, and then the, there's actually almost a vacuum that helps suck the clot back out. And once again, you can see almost immediately there's a reconstitution of blood flow. That also has a longer six-hour time window. So, so that's all, so that's great. That's the TPA. That's the 10% of our strokes. But what about the 90%? You know, being a stroke center actually has been shown to improve the outcome for those 90% of those people. Because A, it helps make sure that you're hitting all the tests you need to hit. Make sure that you're getting a quick evaluation, that you're treating them with all the medications you need. In addition, it decreases the peristroke complications that are the source of a f high morbidity, mortality, and stroke patients. So it decreases aspiration pneumonia and DVTs and falls. It also improves long-term outcome. And so the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association had done some long-term trials over the past five years when stroke centers were being talked about and showed that stroke centers primary stroke centers can dramatically improve their patients' outcomes. So here's where we start talking about our ischemic strokes. And this is where our stroke protocols help you in terms of what do you order? How do you manage your patients? So as simple as it seems, an aspirin really does mean the difference between life or death in some stroke patients. And there have been multiple trials that have shown giving aspirin in the emergency room as soon as you know there's no blood in the head decreases your 30-day mortality rate in a stroke patient. It's kind of like giving an aspirin to a, a um, acute MI. And as you can see, I put in per rectal because a lot of times patients can't swallow. So we're not going to ignore them. We're going to give them the per rectal aspirin. And all of that should be happening right away in the emergency room, but if you have a patient who's on a telemetry floor, that should always be the first thing handed. And our stroke order sets actually take over it from that, because we actually t write down, you should do these labs and these medications stat, if not already done in the emergency room. The, and also, though, even in the kind of acute phase, those first few days, what aspirin does is it prevents further thrombotic events from happening in the penumbra. So everyone knows an acute thrombotic event causes a vague hypercoagulability from the cytokine cascade, and an aspirin will help prevent that from worsening. So, you know, this is the brain that's gone, and there isn't a lot you can do anything about that brain but this is the brain that accounts for why sometimes you see a perfectly good-looking patient who has a little bit of weakness, and you put them to bed, and seven hours later, they can't move one side of their body. So it's always an antiplatelet unless you have a pretty strong reason why not. And we always ask patients, yeah, what's your real allergy to aspirin? Because the majority of people like to say they have an allergy to aspirin. It's actually a GI upset. So then the next big question that always comes into play is, well, when do I anticoagulate patients? So we now know, and this has been known for about 20 years now, because we all thought that maybe if we gave all the stroke patients heparin, it would help people. Turns out it actually harmed people. So IV heparin has very little role in the acute stroke setting. It certainly has no role in the thrombotic strokes. So really... It only has a role in the cardioembolic strokes or in patients that might be hypercoagulable. What you need to realize is that putting a patient on IV heparin after a stroke increases their risk of symptomatic hemorrhagic conversion by 30% because it's dead brain and there's friable blood tissue. 
it is not appropriate for patients whose strokes are large. So often, if you think it's a very large hemispheric stroke, and really it's a 20% of a hemisphere, this is going to have a very high chance of bleeding. How about if it's a large embolic stroke? I wouldn't do it because really it's going to turn the dead tissue bloody. And of course, the dead tissue won't care, but you're going to compress all the living tissue. And this is why, actually, Steve, your question, there is a very low risk of a second embolic event in the first 96 hours. However, just because we're saying no IV heparin doesn't mean that we couldn't potentially start the moncomidin so that they will be therapeutic in a few days. So it's a slow drift up. It is appropriate to start the moncomidin once you know that they can swallow safely. So it's, it's kind of silly to be trying to give them coumadin if it's going to go down their lungs or they're going to need a peg tube anyway and you're going to have to reverse them. But if they're swallowing well, it's absolutely appropriate to try the coumadin and slowly let them drift up. Um, there is a lot of talk, particularly, you know, in the whole age where we're supposed to get patients out of the hospital quickly, about whether we couldn't use a low molecular weight heparin like Lovenox and send them on their way. And unfortunately, we can't because with, with things like Lovenox, it has a very long half-life. It also has the possibility of kind of a super therapeutic state and that can lead to a lot more hemorrhages. So Lobinox at this point has been discounted um, for anticoagulation use in acute strokes, even for technically DVT prophylaxis because of the long half-life. We don't know if you suddenly end up having a problem and you have a hemorrhagic conversion, how long are you going to have to wait for that Lovenox to get clear your blood? The second big issue that you're always going to see on all the stroke order sets are the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors or the statins. And really, even though a lot of people will say, no, don't start the statin until we know what their cholesterol is, statins acutely have been shown to reduce neuronal injury in the acute stroke. And they think it's because of that vague anti-inflammatory effect that has been a big talk. Um, Similarly, statins have been shown to decrease the risk of recurrent stroke in patients even with normal cholesterol. So we tend to encourage everybody that, you know, we kind of give you a hint. You know, you'll look at your order sets and you'll see uh, statin, and there'll be a line waiting for you to fill in one. But we're not going to pre-check it off because some patients have allergies to statins, some patients have severe liver disease, but... It is a good idea to actually give them a statin within the first 24 hours. Um, similarly, then comes the next big question, blood pressure. And a lot of times you're going to have nurses um, who maybe aren't used to the stroke orders yet because they're new nurses. We're certainly coming June and July, the new interns. What to do with that blood pressure? The issue with blood pressure and ischemic stroke is that you know, the brain has lost its ability to autoregulate, which means normally when your blood pressure drops, your brain is very smart. It dilates the blood vessels, keeps your CNS circulation up. In the setting of ischemia, that is lost. And so often what you're trying to save, and that's what you have to keep remembering, is you're trying to save the surrounding penumbra. You're trying to save the brain that's at risk but not dead yet. So you want to avoid a sudden normalization of blood pressure unless there's another medical reason. They came in with a massive MI. If they have very poor cardiac function, if there is an aortic or a carotid or a vertebral dissection that's only going to worsen issues, then of course you may have to normalize that blood pressure quickly. But normally, what we do with ischemic strokes, we will certainly keep you on your standing antihypertensive medications if they already came in on it. If they didn't come in on any, 
We're going to recommend you start some standing blood pressure medications, but at the same time, we're going to say don't use PRNs unless that blood pressure is greater than 220 over 110 in the first 72 hours. Because often, you know, you use one PRN, you shockingly drop that pressure, and the penumbra becomes ischemic. Because the other issue to remember is, and a lot of people who manage strokes all the time will see that TIAs and strokes come in with extraordinarily high blood pressure, which normalizes very quickly. And that's just more a body reaction in an attempt to save the brain. Now, that's ischemic. When it's a hemorrhagic stroke or you've given TPA, you need much tighter blood pressure control. You really don't want systolics of 220 and diastolics of 120 pounding away at the blood vessels. And then let's talk about this very kind of important subset of ischemic strokes. This is the whole hemisphere. When, you know, you find a patient who was down on the floor and missing for 24 hours and they have a whole hemisphere gone, these are the strokes that you can at least start to make sure that family re realizes this is serious. So 25 to 50 percent mortality in the first 30 days. Unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do for these people. There's no role for steroids. There are a lot of ongoing trials right now in terms of mannitol and 3% normal saline. And what we have to remember is what these trials and why the trials have been going on for years, and they're often inconclusive, is that mannitol and 3% normal saline does not work on the damaged stroke. It doesn't work on that big edematous damaged area brain. It's working on the living brain. So it is dehydrating the good cells in the attempt to make room in that tight box. Also, this is where it's lucky to have a neurosurgeon because for very young patients, there have been times when we've done emergent craniotomies to try to um, save the brain. Although often when we're at that point, we're often warning families, do you really want to be doing this because there's an even higher risk of significant morbidity and mortality, but it is one of those efforts where often you more see it probably in trauma centers where motor vehicle accidents led to carotid dissections, which led to very large strokes in very young people, and there's an, a last-ditch effort to save someone. So then the next issue is hemorrhagic strokes. And before Dr. O'Donnell, our neurosurgeon, came, these were the hemorrhagic strokes we were all very comfortable managing at Lourdes, small subcortical hemorrhages that you just need to require careful monitoring, and you need to make some decisions about when you can or can't restart antiplatelets or anticoagulation medications. And neurosurgeons don't need to even hear about these strokes. Um, and your hemorrhagic stroke order sets are actually going to help guide you through and tell you when do you get that repeat CAT scan. And they'll tell you don't use, and they'll list exactly what medications you should be avoiding. However, these are the strokes where even if you don't think they're going to need neurosurgical intervention, often Dr. O'Donnell can can tell you that I'll call him up and just warn him, hey, be aware, this patient has been admitted. Because these are the patients that can very quickly go bad. So it's the very large hemorrhages, certainly the intraventricular hemorrhages, or the posterior fossa hemorrhages. These are the people that might end up needing a um, extraventricular drain because of hydrocephalus. These are the people that might need an emergent craniotomy and clot evacuation. Um, these are the people who, if they are on Coumadin, you need to reverse their anticoagulation right away. And on our order set, you'll see, we're saying use FFP. We want it reversed right away, not the vitamin K that's going to come about in two or three days. Also, they get re-imaged a lot more frequently. And these type of hemorrhages are always going to our critical care unit. Now, what to do in terms of what if you have a malignant hypertension 
or you have a hemorrhagic stroke that you can, just can't bring down the blood pressure. The best antihypertensive infusion at this point known is the nicardipine because there is no significant increase in intracranial pressure. The blood vessels don't really significantly dilate. Labetalol, they dilate slightly. Maybe there's a slight increase in intracranial pressure and volume, but not much. However, the drug that you really want to avoid, so just in case you hear that a resident got to a patient and is now telling you what they've done, you want to avoid nitroprusside as there is a rapid uh, vasodilatation, both arterial and venous in the head. There's a significant increase in intracranial pressure. There's times when there's nothing else you can do but nipride, but really that should be the drug of last resort. So what are the other ways that stroke patients get sick and there's an increased mortality and morbidity in the hospital? Well, sometimes it's iatrogenic or it's secondary to the stroke. Fevers are associated with a worse prognosis. For every one degree Fahrenheit that is above 98.6, uh, they say that stroke patients seem to have a 10 to 15 percent less improvement in the long term. And that's because really, you once again, you help the cytokine cascades. So you helped tissue death. So things that we can avoid with fevers, aspiration pneumonia, which is directly linked to 20% of deaths in stroke patients in the first 30 days. We have immediate swallowing evaluation. You're not waiting for the speech therapist here. On our admission order sets, we tell you how to do a bedside swallow that was designed by a speech therapist. And based on that bedside swallow, you can actually decide whether or not you can feed your patients or let them take medications by mouth. The important thing to remember is stroke is not like a pre-surgical patient. NPO means strict NPO, because Plavix in your lung is just as bad as a bite of turkey sandwich. So if you're NPO, then you're going to have to give all medications per rectum or in IV form. We tend to discourage immediate NG placement for patients unless there's really medications you can't skip, like if they're a liver transplant patient, uh, because it does increase intracranial pressure. So Lisa, what would you do for a stroke? Aspirin failure, dysphagia, and? Acutely, give them aspirin per rectum. Okay. You know, because when you're an aspirin failure, you're more looking long term for that secondary prevention. Are you going to switch antiplatelet drugs? It probably would be a better idea to at least acutely in the first day give them an aspirin per rectum. And often people who fail our bedside swallow tests in the emergency department will pass a formal swallow test because we're giving them water to drink. But when they have a nectar thickened liquid, maybe they can tolerate their medications and their food. Similarly, UTIs, if you can, try to avoid long-term indwelling catheters. What else kills stroke patients? DVTs. Now, here, we actually put on our order sets that the only indication for bed rest besides TPA is lethargy. Otherwise, we want all of our patients pulled out of bed and try to have early mobilization. We also recommend that they have some type of pharmaceutical um, DVT prophylaxis. The preferred is the subcutaneous unfractionated heparin. With the low molecular weight heparins, there have been a lot of trials going on, and there's still a concern for a long half-life in patients um, who could possibly be having a hemorrhagic conversion. And so it just may not be appropriate for all patients. And that's why right now our order sets are reflecting the preferred subcutaneous, certainly particularly for hemorrhagic strokes and your 24 hours post-TPA, they need the DBT prophylaxis as well. 
and that's when we recommend the stockings and uh, the compression. Now this is something we often forget, but heart disease and brain disease is happening all at once. And actually, an acute cardiac event accounts for 15% mortality in the first 30 days after a stroke and up to 28% in the first year. And that's why you'll often see on our order sets, we recommend that everyone gets an echo, that everyone has an EKG, that everyone has cardiac enzymes, and we really do strongly recommend that everyone gets a cardiology consult. Um, and if we could achieve near 100% for that, that would actually put us close to the top in the country because often where we're falling short on these people are the young stroke patients, which actually you would think if you're questioning why a young person had a stroke, you might really want a cardiology input, as well as we're really falling short in women. And that's kind of a nationwide um, problem right now is that pretty much if you're a female, you're going to have less cardiac testing. Um, so we do try to kind of give you a hint of perhaps choosing a cardiology group. So that was all the, the acute management in the hospital. But now you're trying to package them up to go home or you're seeing them in your office because they came out of a hospital not Lourdes because if they come to Lourdes, everything would be set. So this is the current um, medication regimen that is considered the standard of care. Everyone should be on an antiplatelet, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Everyone, if they can tolerate it, should be on a statin. And everyone, if they can tolerate it, should be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Um, studies have shown, actually, that even in young stroke patients who don't have hypertension and don't have dyslipidemia, low-dose statins and low-dose ACEs help stabilize the endothelial um, aspect of arteries and actually do prevent secondary strokes. Of course, you all know this. You want to control your diabetes, um, avoid your tobacco and your other fun things. Um, this is a big part that we can actually educate our patients, although everyone talks about the therapeutic one glass of red wine per day, which is true. It is protective. Excess alcohol isn't. So if you start to hear a patient talk about, I have three beers a day, two cocktails, and half a bottle of wine per day, that actually increases your risk of stroke, and it's actually hemorrhagic stroke that it increases. Similarly, this is something you want to watch for as well, and you want to start screening for is estrogen therapy. Whether it's birth control or whether it's estrogen therapy for menopause after strokes, it's currently recommended that estrogen be avoided or the lowest dose possible be administered. Similarly, legal stimulants. You know, we are kind of, we're a population that's, as we're getting older, we're seeing more and more people with strokes who happen to have gotten an ADHD diagnosis and are on Ritalin. Um, those stimulants can cause an arteropathy, just like cocaine can, as well as, of course, uncontrolled hypertension. And we all like to talk about anticoagulation for arrhythmias. As most of you probably know me, you know, I don't like to talk about fall risk. From my standpoint, you know, 100 falls, okay, then I would buy that you could be in big trouble. But really, we need to make sure that we really decide that before we prevent someone from getting anticoagulated for arrhythmias, that we have some strong cause. Okay, so let's talk about antiplatelets, which is always the big controversy. It certainly is the only proven therapy for prevention of small and large artery thrombosis. Currently, it is a monotherapy for stroke prevention. Okay, the big trials, um, the Capri trial, and um, came out in. 2006, and that's where it became clear that double antiplatelet therapy, long-term, 
does not increase stroke prevention, but it does increase spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. And even the cardiologists now are starting to monitor their patients and saying that, well, after a year of having that stent placed, maybe it's time to back off of the double antiplatelets. Which is the better drug to choose? Well, all of the large trials have actually ultimately shown it's, there's no clinical significant difference between any of the antiplatelet therapies. Uh, the most recent trial was the PROFESS trial, where it was the head-to-head um, clopidogrel or the Plavix versus aspirin and extended uh, release diprimidol, which was the Agronox. So there's no real significant um, difference, and yet this is where this comes in a little bit of the art of medicine. And here we have to try to tailor our therapy to what we know our patients will do. Aspirin, 81 milligrams. It's low cost. It's three dollars a month, which means everyone can afford it. It's typically well tolerated. We often tell our patients, take your aspirin with the biggest meal of your day so you don't have stomach upset. And it has multiple other purposes, both heart disease and peripheral arterial disease. So what if they're an aspirin failure? Or what if they really have a true allergy to aspirin? Another alternative is clopidogrel or Plavix. Without insurance, the cheapest you can get it is $130 per month. It is well tolerated. However, there is an increase in GI hemorrhaging over aspirin. It once again has multiple purposes, both heart disease and peripheral arterial disease. Um, but what's really important to remember is the aspirin and Plavix therapy is associated with spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhages. And of course, also, a lot of surgeons will tell you you know, they're going to not do surgery, preferably, until you've held that Plavix for five to seven days. So what about the aspirin plus extended to release diprimidol? It's slightly more expensive uh, than the Plavix if you have no insurance. It's $161 a month. It has no cardiovascular protection. And it actually is contraindicated if you're dealing with a patient who has a stroke as well as an MI. It has no peripheral arterial protection. So often in many of our Lord's patients who are complicated vascular patients, Agronox may not be the better drug uh, for the patient. There is a lot of patients, and you'll hear them all the time, complaining about headaches. The headache is not a permanent side effect. It lasts about 30 days. And a lot of patients just can't be convinced to continue the Agronox because the headache, from what they tell me, is horrible and it's, it doesn't respond to Percocet, it doesn't respond to anti-inflammatories. There have been some statements uh, made that if you do want to use Agronox and you want to try to convince your patients to make it through that headache period if you use nightly Agronox only for the first two weeks and then add on the morning dosage as well. You might be able to make the headache a little bit more tolerable. The only important thing that the PROFESS trial ended up finding out when they were comparing the Agronox to Plavix is that there is a higher rate of hemorrhagic stroke with Agronox as opposed to Plavix which of course is not seen when you say it's aspirin versus Plavix. So currently, although there have been no definitive statements out of the FDA, a lot of bigger stroke centers like Jefferson, who played a big role in the PROFESS trial, are recommending that if you have a patient who had a hemorrhagic stroke in the past, you may not want to use Agronox. And then, what about the carotid artery stenosis? This also is something that, this is why we admit TIA patients. We need to know, do you have an arrhythmia? Do you have carotid artery stenosis? Is there something we need to fix right now so that that TIA doesn't turn into a stroke in three days from now? 
if you do have symptomatic carotid artery stenosis, which is considered greater than 60% on the ipsilateral carotid, if you have a TIA, you're supposed to do it emergently. So you don't discharge those patients. Those patients go home after intervention. If you've had a stroke, statements are often made that you need to wait, in America, it's four to six weeks. In Europe, it tends to be about two to three weeks after a stroke because, unfortunately, when they do an, a carotid intervention, whether it's an endarterectomy or a stent, there's blood pressure changes, and often there are accompanying hemorrhages or worsening strokes in those patients acutely. So we're delaying it secondary to our concern of a reperfusion injury. However, our vascular surgeons can tell you that there are some cases where, unfortunately, we know there's a critical stenosis, there is a new stroke, but there's a lot of brain to save on that side, and it's the dominant hemisphere, and a lot of our very good vascular surgeons will go in within a week. And at Our Lady of Lords, you actually can present your patients some choices about endarterectomy versus stenting. Currently, we're in all the big trials um, at Lords that actually is trying to see about um, the efficacy and um, adverse events in terms of stenting versus endarterectomy. A lot of the numbers are still being crunched everywhere across the country, but right now the current statements are that there seems to be no difference between peri-procedure adverse events, between uh, carotid uh, endarterectomies and stents. Um, however, we don't know about the long-term um, efficacy of stents. So really, you have to decide this on an individual patient basis. You have to take into account the risk factors for surgery, um, the risk factors for having to be on medications like Plavix after a stent, um, but that's basically something that, you know, all the vascular surgeons will help you with when you have that issue. And that's the end. Dr. Sure, Lisa will answer questions, but before you go, uh, two things. One is by filling out the CME certificate. If you don't have one, it's right outside, you'll get CME credit. Number two, there is a short quiz. We are asking the people that want to accept stroke patients through the ER, fill out the quiz. If you have questions about it, feel free to ask right now, because really the quiz, from our standpoint, is towards um, some of the lecture. Yeah. Knowing uh, you know, what we need to do to manage stroke. So feel free to you know, look at the slides, ask your neighbor. Ask Lisa, she'll stay for a few minutes. No, absolutely. We are asking people to fill it out, but it's really just to, if you're not getting CD credit, if you're not getting CD credit, you don't have to fill it out. But if you want to accept strokes to the ER, we have, are asking you to fill it out. We're also going to use it for people that um, uh, may be watching this later uh, by, uh, by video to know that they've looked at it and that they uh, have answered questions. But uh, we appreciate it if you guys would. I was at a mm -hmm. uh, symposium last week, and uh, the flavor from the people and the neuro people there was mm -hmm. that uh, stenting was inferior and perhaps more dangerous than um, endorectomies. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I know it's still somewhat controversial. Right. Well, they, they were sort of, you know, very, very, this was a USC symposium. Yeah. Very, A lot of the controversy about stenting has been that early on in the trials, they were not using a distal protective device. So they would go up into that carotid artery that was filled with cholesterol plaque, and they would knock things free. Um, currently in America, all carotid stents are done with a distal protective device so that you can actually capture all of the schmutz, for better way of putting it, and drag it down. Um, the other aspect of it is is that stenting has enabled cardiologists to fix more arteries. And so there are a lot more people being stented 
that would never have undergone endarterectomy, perhaps because of advanced stage or multiple other medical problems for asymptomatic stenosis. What we do know is that if you treat symptomatic stenosis, the endarterectomy and the stents seem to be equivalent. But it's the asymptomatic that you're absolutely right. They are finding a lot more complications. Um, but it's more, once again, a center-by-center -center basis. Here we have an equivalent number of complications. Um, but often, a lot of patients that are sent in for stent are sent back home without one um, here because we'll review the case and decide that they're not appropriate. Mm -hmm. A surgeon's track record before with uh, uh, endoterectomy, whether they symptomatic or asymptomatic, mm -hmm. symptomatic 6%, 3%. Is there, are there generated uh, statistics for our guys for stents? There are, and they are equivalent. In fact, actually, at Our Lady of Lourdes, for the endoterectomies, I believe we are a less than 1.5% complication rate from stroke, and for the stents, we are 1.7% complication rate. So there are numbers are generated, and stents are like endarterectomies. You want to go to someone who does a lot of them every year, because it's true their practice makes perfect. That's exactly. Uh, and again, it depends on the comorbidity of the patient. So a lot of the, um, the uh, endovascular approaches are done where there's not the comorbidities. But all things being said, I mean, I'm certain that have an endoarthrectomy than a stent because of, you know, going, as right. Joe says, to someone who is a recognized person that's doing enough that their complication rate is under the 3% is considered the and we certainly don't recommend that young patients get stents, you know, because we don't know what the long-term outlook is like. We recommend, really, we more recommend people get stents who are very high risk. Um, you know what's funny, and this may be, have nothing to do with it, mm -hmm. They don't. Yep. And I think also that also kind of represents people go running into the emergency room if they have a twinge of chest pain, but they it may take them two days, even if they're dragging the leg to come into the ER. to the penumbra, exactly. Right. I think it gets the uh, patient started on the right foot because it 
uh, follows the really what is considered the standard of care. And in fact, we need to have them filled out to maintain our our uh, certification as a stroke center. That's one of the things mm -hmm. they look at. Is it for yeah. I thought it was the important thing, particularly come June or July, remember to not just tell them fill out the stroke order sets, but go over it with them because almost no box is pre-checked, which means you're going to have to go over those boxes with them and make sure they're checking things off appropriately. You can pull them up. They are online under the physician order sets, um, and you can even tell residents who have access to the dashboard that they can pull it up online that way. Otherwise, all the floors as well as the emergency room is supposed to have them. And if they don't go to the dashboard, we soon are going to be changing the menu so it will be friendlier. There will be a physician section that you'll just go into and you'll see order sets will be easier. But there is a way of getting it now um, where if you go into uh, under uh, for this department's uh, this our lady of lords and medical affairs with some of the order sets. So you don't need to sign in. You can just do the internet. Yeah. As far as what's most important, uh -huh. as far as adding an ACE or an OF for endothelial mm -hmm. function, as opposed to keeping the perfusion pressure up by maintaining a high mm -hmm. blood pressure, you don't really start playing around with the blood pressure and want it run high until maybe three days or so afterwards where you try to get someone who's normally hypertensive down to maybe 140 or 150, mm -hmm. as opposed to try, trying to get that ACE on board, is that true? Right. The real thing is you want to get on board immediately is an antiplatelet. If it's an ischemic stroke, a statin is probably a lot more important in that first few days than an ACE or an ARB. We do allow our patients to continue to be on some of their home blood pressure medications. And certainly if they're very hypertense people, on no blood pressure medications, we might start them on a low dose ACE, at least to get something into their system to start. But yeah, in terms of the endothelial protection, that's more seen over the, the long term. Lisa, yeah. Exactly when would you start the cardine drip? Um, the cardine drip is typically after people have been unresponsive to two or three PRNs. That's typically when we start the cardiac drip. So if it's after TPA um, or before TPA, it's going to be, you know, after two PRNs, a hemorrhagic stroke, you're going to have to kind of play your, your numbers. But typically after you've tried with a few PRNs, that's when you... So often your patients are already going to be on a cardiac drip by the time they're out of the emergency room. Thanks. Thank